Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of our Business in 2024 Tuesday webinar. Um, next slide, Kathy. Just wanted to start out with a um, another reminder that we'll be holding our annual workplace conference in cities all across New York State. Uh, registration is now open, so you can go to our website to do that. I did want to just note there, Buffalo doesn't appear on the list. We will be doing a program in Buffalo. Um, more information to come about that. So um, moving on to today's agenda, we have three presenters today um, from across New York State. We're going to first start talking about uh, something that um, we've been hearing a lot about in the news, which is the upcoming solar eclipse. And from the perspective of employers, what should you be thinking about for this event that's coming uh, very soon? Uh, then Howard, Howard Miller, uh, a favorite presenter on our webinar from our Garden City office, will talk about um, some recent U.S. Supreme Court, a, a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision. Uh, and finally, Michael Cratchville down in our New York City office will talk about a proposed law in New York City about non-compete. So that's what we got today. So let's start out with the, the um, front page story that we're seeing a lot in our news, which is the solar eclipse with Allison Roche in our um, Buffalo office, appropriately since Buffalo is going to be one of the locations um, that experiences um, the eclipse at its at its biggest, largest, longest. I don't know how to describe it, but you can tell us about it, Allison. <laughs> yes. Um, thanks, Kristen. So uh, as many of you probably know, um, less than two weeks from today, on April 8th, 2024, uh, many areas of New York State will experience a total solar eclipse. Um, so sev several regions of the state, including the areas around Buffalo, Jamestown, Niagara Falls, Rochester, Syracuse, Watertown and Plattsburgh um, will all be in the direct path of totality, um, and then other parts of the state will also be able to view a partial solar eclipse. Um, so we're mindful of the fact that obviously not everyone on this webinar will be impacted, um, but we did want to put together a brief presentation just on considerations for employers in light of the next total, in light of this uh, total solar eclipse. So. Uh, what What is a total solar eclipse? Um, so on April 8th, certain areas of the United States, including um, particular regions in New York State, um, the sun and the moon will align and the moon will block out the entirety of the sun as it passes between the sun and earth. Um, so the entire sky will go dark and it will appear as though night has fallen in the afternoon. Um, for instance, in Buffalo, where I'm located, we are directly in the path of totality. Um, so we're going to have a, a longer eclipse than others. Um, so, you know, the partial eclipse for us begins around 2.04 p.m. And then the eclipse will reach totality in that it'll be completely dark um, around 3.18 p.m. And then this will last about three to four minutes. And then the eclipse will end at around 4.30 p.m. Um, so observers will notice a change in the wind direction, the temperature, and noises in nature uh, because animals will think that it's nighttime. Um, and if there are clear skies, stars and planets may appear, and observers might even catch a glimpse of the sun's swirling atmosphere. Uh, so as long as you have a clear view of the sky and you're in the eclipse's path of totality, the eclipse can be viewed from anywhere. Um, to put this in perspective for employers, um, so for many people, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to see a total solar eclipse in these areas in New York State. Um, to give a little additional context, the last solar eclipse, total solar eclipse in these areas was in 1925, and the next solar eclipse in these areas, the next total solar eclipse in these regions will be in 2144. Um, so the good news for employers here is that hopefully this is the last time you have to think about the implications of a total solar eclipse on your business. Um, next slide, please, Kathy. So how will workplaces be affected by the total solar eclipse? Um, extremely heavy traffic is expected throughout the path of totality. Um, New York State is expecting millions of eclipse tourists, and, and many areas of the state are concerned about gridlock traffic, um, both in the morning when people are presumably heading to destinations to watch the eclipse, but then also in the afternoon and um, during the eclipse. So because traffic is expected to be extremely heavy, um, local guidance in many areas recommends residents stay at home or at a location where they can comfortably stay for a while before, during, and after the eclipse. Um, for instance, in Erie County, where I'm located, um, the county is recommending avoiding non-essential travel, and many of our local school districts have canceled classes. So employers are likely to see traffic jams affecting their businesses and staff. Um, and might want to evaluate whether certain employees can and should work remotely. 
Um, and employers should also anticipate delivery and logistical problems due to standstill traffic um, and de develop backup plans accordingly. Next slide, please, Kathy. So how should employers deal with requests for time off? Um, the eclipse falls on a Monday, which is obviously a typical workday for many of us, um, and we expect that employers will see a spike in time off requests or requests to work remotely uh, just due to the rarity of the eclipse and the fact that many uh, schools will likely be closed. Um, so to the extent possible, employers should follow their normal practices and procedures regarding time off requests um, on Monday, April 8th. Um, you should review your policies and just consider um, what best, how, how you would best handle a spike in requests. Um, and if all requests for time off can't be granted, um, managers should expect that there will probably be more absences than usual on April 8th and, and just plan accordingly. And really the key is just to enforce your time off policies uniformly. Um, just carefully consider time requests for time off um, because these could ultimately lead to discrimination claims um, if not if employees are not treated fairly with these requests. Um, so evaluate requests fairly, consistent with your you know existing policies and procedures. Um, and you can also supplement by a reward or lottery system um, if requests are too overwhelming. Um, some cultures and religions find special significance in solar eclipses, so you should also be aware that employees may request this time off based on religious beliefs and practices. Um, and basically, this means that an employer should listen carefully to an employee's time off request as to whether the request is framed as a need to engage in a protected religious practice. Um, as a reminder, employers are required to reasonably accommodate religious practices of employees um, unless doing so would result in substantial undue hardship. Um, so even if the employer doesn't agree that the eclipse has religious significance, um, the employer cannot discriminate nor retaliate against an employee who sincerely believes that it does. Um, if significant absences would prove um, or pose uh, operational difficulties for your business, it might make sense to just remind employees ahead of time of the proper way to request time off and the repercussions of failing to adhere to the established call-in procedures. Really, um, again, the best practice is just to continue to follow your existing policies and procedures, um, and to the extent possible, try and enforce time off policies consistently. Um, remember that some Unexpected absences are inevitable on April 8th, um, so just, you know, plan for that. Um, some employers may wish to encourage and increase workplace attendance by having incentives like a company eclipse watching party or by granting employees some time off during the day to take a break and watch the eclipse. Um, this could obviously be a great incentive to get people into the office on these days, um, but as we'll discuss on the next slide, if this is the case, we really strongly recommend that employers provide Eclipse viewing glasses. Um, next slide, please, Kathy. Um, as we all know, it is not safe to stare directly at the sun, um, even if you're staring through a camera, binoculars, or a telescope. Um, and people have to protect their eyes during all phases of the partial eclipse and during most um, most of the total eclipse, just since looking at the sun can result in permanent eye damage and blindness, as we all know. Um, so as a result, all eclipse observers should view the event indirectly with eclipse glasses, which are inexpensive and uh, readily available in the uh, areas um, that are going to be subjected to the total eclipse. Um, so we recommend that employers consider educating employees about these safety issues just to ensure that no one damages their eyesight. And this is really especially important if the employer is hosting an eclipse watch party. Um, because depending on numerous factors, an employer could hypothetically be on the hook for workers' compensation liability for injuries suffered during a work-sanctioned eclipse event. Um, you know, there have obviously been situations where a company-sponsored social event has led to a workers' comp claim. So, um, again, please make sure um, that the eclipse watch parties are voluntary, and we really, really strongly recommend providing eclipse glasses, um, especially if you're encouraging employees to take a break to appreciate the eclipse. Um, similarly, if you have employees that are driving or working outdoors during the eclipse, you really need to provide direction for how the employees should handle the sudden darkness um, and other expected conditions like, you know, major traffic. Um, and then just consider 
what any necessary safety precautions to prevent accidents perhaps caused by the reduction in light or um, heavy and erratic traffic, traffic patterns. Um, and if you have employees that will be working outside or have to be outside during the eclipse, um, really employers should provide and require that these employees wear eclipse glasses. Um, and employers should also consider adjusting work schedules, break times, and other tasks just to um, minimize the need for outdoor activities during the peak of the eclipse. Um, basically, we we really think that employers should provide education and training to employees about the potential risks associated with viewing a solar eclipse without proper eye protection, and then um, offer guidance on safe viewing practices or provide um, you know, solar eclipse glasses. Uh, finally, it might make sense for your business to offer remote work options for employees who may prefer to view the eclipse from the safety of their home. Um, and again, even if you have these remote employees, it certainly doesn't hurt to provide guidance on how to safely view the eclipse from home and to just encourage employees to follow recommended safety practices. Um, and if you have any further questions about how the eclipse might affect your business, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or, or to the bond attorney um, with whom you're regularly in contact with. Uh, thanks, and back to you, Kristen. Great. Thanks, Allison, for that uh, helpful overview um, of an unusual event we have coming up. I know I, hear, I sit here in Syracuse, so we will be affected as well. Um, so next on our agenda is Howard Miller. Um, so Howard's going to tell us about a recent case about social media use by public officials. Um, thanks, Howard. Oh, you're muted. Um, thank you. Um, Kathy, can you please go to the first slide? So I'm going to date myself a little bit here. When I first started practicing law, there was no social media. Um, my kids liken this to the dark ages, and they think it's positively medieval that there was actually a time when before you purchased clothes, you actually went into a store and tried them on, as opposed to just clicking a button on Amazon. Um, but now social media is just a huge part of my practice, both in the public sector and in the private sector. Um, typically, I see this in the context of employee misconduct on social media, uh, a lot, frankly, involving um, pornography. The way this plays out day to day is I will get a call from a client saying, I'm going to send you a link to an employee's social media site that I need you to look at. Um, right away, I know nothing good is going to come of this. Nobody sends me a link to anything that is wholesome. I never get a link to seeing a video of a group of puppy golden retrievers frolicking through a meadow or of a sunset at Key West. Um, it's usually something awful. So the way that this happens, I will go to click on the link and I will find out immediately that Bond's IT filters block what I'm about to see. So then I have to have an uncomfortable con conversation with IT. I have to call them up and they say and say, can you please unblock this website? And they'll say to me, Howard, this is the fifth time this week that you are asking permission to go into a website that per contains pornography. Um, you should know that we do have a very good employee assistance program for you. You might want to avail yourself of that. Um, anyway, once I get the web link unblocked, um, I'm about to click on it. I open my desk drawer. I take out a Pez dispenser. I fill it with Xanax, and then I click the button. Um, and usually what I see is something that I can't later unsee and um, worse than looking straight into a solar eclipse. Um, but the other part of social media, at least when it pertains to public employees and public officials, is the First Amendment. And it's very common now for if you become a board member or you're a public official, that you have your own Facebook page. And the question becomes, at what point does that Facebook page become an arm of the state such that you can no longer exercise the right to block people from commenting on it. So if we can go to the next slide. So there are two cases that made their way to the Supreme Court, one out of the Ninth Circuit, one out of the Sixth Circuit. In, this, in the case out of the Ninth Circuit, the Garnet case, you had two members who ran for Board of Education. After they became members of the Board of Education, they continued to use their social media page to inform 
constituents about board activities. We can go to the next slide. And what these board members did, they actually, in essence, made their Facebook page um, a virtual office for their um, capacity as a board member. So let's take it before social media. If two school board members decided that a couple of times a week they were going to host office hours at, a, at the school district's offices where members of the community could come in and ask questions of them, discuss policy with them, discuss employee issues with them, I think we would have no problem saying that that is state action. They are acting in their capacity as board members when they do that. And if they're going to do that, they can't say we will only meet with members of the public who agree with our political positions, because that is viewpoint discrimination. What happens here and what the court has to decide is what is the Facebook page of these board members? Is it their private page or is it really an adjunct of the school board's page? Uh, next slide. So in this case, the Federal Appeals Court in the Ninth Circuit, which sits in California, held that this these pages of these board members had become state action. And the board members could not block people from putting comments on their pages that they didn't agree with. And they could not block people from entering their web pages, again, who had views that they didn't agree with. Uh, next slide, please. The second case was the Linky case, and this had took place in the Sixth Circuit. Um, you had uh, Mr. Linky, I'm sorry, Mr. Freed, who was a city manager. Um, starting in college, he started his own Facebook page. Eventually, this page grew to 5,000 friends. I have to say, I have about four friends on my Facebook page, and two of those I had to pay to be friends. Um, so this is amazing, 5,000. Um, and he would post things about his family life. He was prolific in posting things about his day-to-day -day activities um, with his family. And once in a blue moon, he would post things about work. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, so he would occasionally um, post things about COVID-19 and other things um, in passing. But primarily, it was his own personal page. Um, so example with my own Facebook page, which is very boring. Um, the only things I typically post um, are um, things about my dog, Bella, who is over there in the corner, um, which aggravates my cat, Oliver, that I don't post about him. Um, but if once in a while I were to post something about um, my work, let's say um, later today, I post that I spoke at a webinar for Bond. That really doesn't make my Facebook page an adjunct of Bond's um, official page. Um, and next slide, please. So here, the same thing that happened in Garnet. You had someone now say, well, I want to be able to criticize you on your Facebook page. And you've made it a public action because um, you are a town official. Um, next page. So in this case, um, the town official wins. And what the Court of Appeals basically says is that this was not state action. This was not his virtual office. This was really his personal Facebook page. And the fact that once in a blue moon, he would post something about town business did not alter that conclusion. So both of these cases go up to the Supreme Court at the same time. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, one more, we'll go to the Supreme Court decision. Uh, one more. And uh, this, this month we got a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. And first of all, the fact that we have a unanimous decision is really unusual in this day and age particularly on a topic that could be controversial. So what the Supreme Court said, and this is in the Linkey case, is that in order to constitute state action um, that would bar uh, the official from, that would allow a bar, uh, or sorry, that would prohibit a bar of somebody commenting, um, the Facebook page would have to possess, um, show that the author, 
possess the actual authority to speak on the state's behalf on a particular matter or, and that purported to exercise that authority when speaking in the relevant social media posts. So how does this happen? So let's say there's a statute or a regulation that says um, that the, um, the town administrator or um, the county executive has the authority to speak on behalf of the entity. Um, that Facebook page, again, if it, assuming it's on these similar facts, could constitute state action. Same thing if there was a regular policy of allowing a certain official to speak on behalf of the entity. So let's say a school board had a long history of allowing the board president to speak on behalf of the school board, um, make media comments on behalf of the school board, then that could constitute state action. Um, but when speaking, they also have to be acting as if they have, they're acting with the authority of the state um, entity. So when we go back to the Garnet case, which was um, also remanded with Linky back to the other court, um, those individuals seem to be acting as if they had the authority of the school board to speak on its behalf. And that's what could make it state action. And they were also acting and making it clear on their Facebook pages, they were acting as school board members when they were speaking. Um, now the court drew a distinction here and some of it's very practical. So they, they made a distinction between a board president who says at a public meeting of the Board of Education, all COVID restrictions are now no longer in effect. Now let's say that same board member is at a backyard barbecue and makes those same comments to neighbors. When the board member is speaking to his neighbors at a barbecue, that's not state action, that's clearly personal, they're speaking to their friends. So now we have to transform a Facebook page to whether it looks like the backyard barbecue conversation or whether it looks like the school board meeting. And what should um, people do to protect themselves from First Amendment challenges? I think officials, first of all, should have a clear disclaimer on their Facebook pages that this is only their personal page. It's not for conducting board member business. And then to the extent that they're going to give out generic information about what's going on in the town or the school board, it's better to do it well to link to the school board's own page on their own website or the town's website. So you're not really engaging in a political discussion that would invite commentary. You are only giving information, which would make it more of um, the backyard barbecue conversation. So both the, the Linky and the um, Garnet case were remanded back to the lower courts um, to render a decision using this two-part test. I would imagine that the lower courts would stick to their prior rulings, only doing it using these two-part tests. So with that, thank you. Thanks, Howard. Um, really interesting case, uh, particularly for me, I guess. I, I do a lot of work in the public sector and I definitely had this question from public officials, right? Like. Am I allowed to block this person who's being a jerk on my page? Well, mm. you know, let me take a look at that page and see if it's your page. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so yeah, really interesting stuff. And um, you're welcome back here every day because you give every you put a, a smile on everyone's face. So, yeah. so thank you for that. Um, with that, we're gonna transition over to our third and final presenter today, Michael Cratchaville down in our New York City office. Uh, we're talking about a New York City bill, but gonna add some context about, uh, you know, the, the latest, the, I'm like, cannot speak today, sorry everyone, the latest status of statewide uh, bills on the same issue. So um, with that, uh, take it away, Michael. Sure, thanks, Kristen. Um, you go. you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so on February 28th, 2024, an amendment to the New York City Administrative Code was introduced in the New York City Council, uh, which would effectively prohibit employers from entering into non-compete agreements with their employees, as well as independent contractors. So the proposal itself would amend Section uh, 22511 of the New York City Administrative Code and have uh, pretty far-reaching effects for employers, as well as employees in New York City. 
so as you might have been aware, there was previously a New York state bill that proposed to effectively ban non-compete agreements throughout the state, uh, which sort of provides a good background for the New York City bill. Uh, next slide, please. The New York State bill was passed by the New York State Legislature in uh, June 2023 and was then presented uh, to Governor Hochul in uh, early December 2023. Uh, it likely would have been uh, probably the most restrictive state level ban on employers' use of non compete state. Uh, I believe California, North Dakota, and Oklahoma have already, pa uh, have already passed non compete bans, uh, sorry, compete bans, uh, but the New York State bill would have extended further than uh, all three of those statutes. The FTC also uh, has proposed a broad non-compete ban, uh, which we'll cover in a bit more detail later. Uh, so as you can see, the New York State Bill specifically provided that uh, every contract restraining an individual from engaging in a lawful profession, trade, or business of any kind would be void to the extent of that restraint. So basically, all clauses uh, of a non-compete agreement would survive other than those uh, prohibiting an employee from engaging in uh, a lawful profession or any other sort of um, employment after leaving their current employer. Uh, next slide, please. The New York State bill further gave a private right of action to employees for potential violations of uh, the proposed New York State bill. Uh, this is extremely significant and notably not present in the New York City proposed bill or in the FTC proposed rule. Uh, if found liable for violating the New York State bill, employers could have been subject to uh, liquidated damages uh, of up to $10,000 for each violation, payment for lost compensation, uh, damages resulting from the non-compete agreement's effects, and attorney's fees and costs for the litigation. The California non-compete statute also provides for a private right of action, but I don't believe the North Dakota or Oklahoma statute uh, do so. And uh, so the one silver lining in the New York State bill was that it would not apply retroactively to contracts that were formed before the bill went into effect. So in other words, the bill would prohibit employers from entering into non-compete agreements after the effective date of the proposed bill, but all non-compete agreements in existence before the effective date of the proposed bill would be lawful and enforceable, presuming that they complied with uh, existing law with regards to non-compete agreements. Nevertheless, as you could see, Governor Hochul did veto the bill on uh, December 22nd, 2023, uh, likely after pressure from businesses and industries that rely heavily on non-compete agreements, who pushed for amendments to the um, far-reaching effects of the potential bill. Uh, Governor Hochul reportedly uh, said that she was in favor of striking a, bit, uh, a balance that would protect lower and middle income workers while still allowing non-competes to exist for those employees at higher income levels who uh, may be in, in a better position to sort of negotiate um, on their own. Uh, specifically, she proposed that the non-compete ban could uh, apply to employees making up to maybe, uh, I think it was about $250,000 per year, um, but more highly compensated individuals would be permitted to continue and continuing uh, to enter into non-compete agreements. Uh, Governor Hochul reportedly proposed amendments to the bill in this respect, uh, but after this proposal, negotiations broke down and uh, she subsequently vetoed the bill. Next slide, please. So circling back to the New York City proposed amendment, it would define non-compete agreements broadly to include any and all agreements between an employer and a worker that prevents or effectively prevents the worker from seeking or accepting work for a different employer or from operating a business after the worker no longer works for the employer. This appears to indicate that any agreement that impacts an individual's ability to work for a different employer could be covered um, under the New York City's non-compete statute. However, the amendment likely would not extend as far as confidential information, trade secrets, um, and other sensitive information, all of which can and, and really should still be protected regardless of whether the New York City bill goes into effect. So on the same sort of theme of, of broad application, uh, the proposed amendment would apply to all workers, whether paid or unpaid, including those considered to be independent contractors. There's no exception in, in the New York City bill for uh, higher income earners or potential executives, uh, as was recommended by many businesses, as well as Governor Hochul in the New York State uh, iteration of a non-compete bill. There's also no sale of business exception. Um, which means that if an owner leaves a business and it was considered to be a worker or during or sort of labor during their time at the business, they could um, immediately then re-enter the market and compete with the business that they just sold. Um, 
the distinction of being a worker is is key here uh, because an uninvolved owner might not be considered a worker and and would be more of sort of a, a passive investor. And that passive investor would not be covered under a statute that um, only protects individuals who perform labor for a business. Uh, so omitting this uh, exception could have a substantial impact upon uh, mergers and acquisitions and any sort of um, um, acquiring or, or selling of a business uh, because purchasing any business would then uh, be much more precarious without anything to sort of stop an individual from selling the business and then re-entering the market to compete with the buyer. Next slide, please. Uh, so regarding the New York City uh, New York City bills uh, prohibitions with regards to non-compete agreements, uh, employers cannot enter into or attempt to enter into a non-compete agreement with a worker. Um, as, as you saw previously, the term worker being defined uh, very broadly. Um, and two, maintain a non-compete agreement with the worker. Three, represent to a worker that the worker is subject to a non-compete agreement clause where the employer has no good faith basis to believe that the worker is subject to an enforceable non-compete agreement and for attempt to enforce any existing non-compete agreement. Um, so for the second prohibition regarding the maintaining of a non-compete agreement, uh, the amendment to the New York City bill also states that an employer must rescind a non-compete agreement no later than the date the law goes into effect, which um, that's sort of the, the retroactive application. Um, next slide, please. Um, this requirement that the existing non-competes be rescinded is, is one of the really key differences between the New York City bill and the former New York State bill. Uh, the New York State bill did not apply retroactively, while the New York City bill does. Um, as a result, if the New York City non-compete amendment does get passed, employers would be up against the clock to rescind all existing non-compete agreements by the proposal's effective date, uh, which would be 120 days after the bill is signed into law. Um, those 120 days would give employers a bit of leeway for rescinding existing agreements, but preparations still should be made um, as soon as possible to ensure compliance in the event the bill is passed. Um, and given that the proposed amendment applies retroactively, employers should be extremely cautious in entering into any non-compete agreements um, at this time, uh, New York City employers particularly. Um, and so violations of the proposed amendment uh, would expose employers to civil penalties of up to uh, $500 per violation. Uh, these penalties would be enforced by the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Um, Office of Labor and Policy Standards and uh, could stack up if employers are not up to date on the potential amendment and um, sort of apprised or in the know of all the non-compete agreements uh, that exist at their business uh, at, at the current time. Um, but uh, as we mentioned previously, the statute does not provide for private right of action, meaning that uh, employees cannot seek to recover for, vi for violations of the statute in court. Um, because of this and because um, civil penalties are not paid out to the aggrieved parties, it remains to be seen how strictly um, the Office of Labor Standards would enforce and, and sort of pursue violations of the statute. Um, but this does then add even more uncertainty to the proposed uh, statute, um, even if the threat of litigation is not the same that, that as the New York State non-compete bill would have would have carried. Um, next slide, please. And so as mentioned in the, in the in the first slide, an FTC proposed rule uh, seeks now to ban non-compete agreements on a national scale. Uh, that proposed rule was announced on January 5th, 2023, and the final rule is still pending, but expected to come pretty soon, likely in around um, April, May, or sort of spring, summer 2024. Uh, so the FTC proposed rule is also incredibly far reaching and restrictive. Um, it prohibits, um, as it as it is in its current state, um, it prohibits non-compete agreements between employers and all workers, including independent contractors and unpaid workers. Uh, it would extend to all contract provisions that even have the effect of prohibiting employees from seeking or accepting other employment. The rule would apply retroactively and employers would be required to proactively rescind non-compete agreement clauses, regardless of whether other provisions of an agreement were negotiated in exchange for the non-compete language which is, is similar to the um, New York State proposed um, amendment. And then the FTC rule would supersede all contrary state laws. 
Um, most employers would be covered by this rule if issued, except uh, those that are exempt under the FTC Act, including uh, certain banks, savings and loan associations, uh, common carriers, air carriers, and uh, other nonprofit organizations. As a result, almost all employers who um, end up running afoul of the terms of the eventual FTC rule it, um, would be exposed to fines, penalties, and injunctive relief. But uh, similarly to the, um, the New York State proposed amendment, uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act, which would be implicated under the proposed rule, provides no private right of action, which means that there'd be, there would not be a substantial influx uh, of litigation regarding non-compete agreements. But again, similar to the New York State, uh, sorry, New York City statute, um, it remains to be seen how strict enforcement would be and employers still must take precautions to comply with the potential final version of the FTC rule. Um, within the FTC rule, differing from the New York City statute, um, there is a sale of business uh, exception, but only where the individual selling the business had at least a 25% ownership interest in the business. Um, further, garden leave uh, could still survive under the current proposed rule, allowing an employer to keep an individual away from competitors uh, by extending their employment while restricting access uh, to the business during the relevant garden leave period. Um, this could end up arising as, as one of the main sort of loopholes or, or workarounds for the FTC rules extreme restrictions. Um, and it remains to be seen whether a similar loophole could be used under the New York City's uh, proposed bill. And so the FTC rule would go into effect 60 days following publication and businesses would have to be in, in compliance uh, within 180 days after publication. Um, but given the rule's far reaching effects, uh, act, actual enforcement uh, could be delayed by legal challenges, including um, a likely challenge under the Supreme Court's West Virginia, the EPA decision, which uh, held that an agency cannot claim to discover in a long standing statute uh, an unheralded uh, power representing a transformative expansion in its regulatory authority. So uh, we will continue to keep businesses updated on the FTC rule, as well as the, the recent New York City proposal. Um, and through all this, it, it's, it's still important to note that the New York City bill is really in its early stages and may not even be passed by the New York City Council, um, as the New York State bill ended up being vetoed by um, Governor Hochul. Uh, but given the New York City bill's far-reaching effects and the potential of an imminent uh, FTC rule, uh, it's important for employers to stay on top of the state of non-compete agreements and to consult with an attorney on how to best navigate the widespread legislative and administrative rejection of non-compete agreements. Uh, Thank you. All set? Yeah. Okay. Didn't want to interrupt you. Also, pretty sure I said your last name wrong. Tell, tell, tell us all how it's... Uh, yeah, it's okay. It's Crowderville. Crowderville. Okay. Sorry. I That's realized it after the fact. <laughs> With a name like Smith, I don't have to deal with that, but I used to before my name changed. So I wanted to be sensitive to that. So anyway, thank you so much. Uh, kind of remarkable on this topic. We keep hearing about it, but you know, rarely do we see legis you know legislation or regulatory changes coming on both a federal, state, and local level all at once. You know, so it's kind of inevitable, it seems. Um, so we will continue to keep an eye on it. Thank you all to our presenters for being here today. Thank you all to our attendees for coming and listening. Here are the, as usual, the attendees um, email addresses in case you have any follow-up. And um, I will see you back here in two weeks and Gabe will be here next week as usual. Um, have a good day.